Dresden, 1933, the so-called degenerate art. The New National Socialist Realism Zeiss Inquart, opening the Vienna Exhibition, 1938, on the Eternal Jew. Paris, 1941. I, I was born, uh, I'm the son of a miner, a Welsh miner, and I was born in a valley in South Wales. And then I suppose one of the things that made a difference, I uh, had a, a quite a good, I, really quite an exceptional boy soprano voice, mm -hmm. which of course uh, meant that I went around the Ested Woods competing. Already at the age of eight, uh, I was in singing in operetta, quite complicated things, duets, trios, what have you. And uh, I, I think, in a way, the pattern was set, and I've gone on throughout my life, acting, singing, dancing, the lot. Um, a bright boy, I suppose you'd say, scholarship boy. Um, in those days, you see, there weren't any grants. Yeah. What year were you actually born in? So I can uh, 1907, uh -huh. before the First World War. We used to act out uh, movies that we saw on the Saturday, you know. Uh, there was a, a wonderful serial called The Broken Coin. 
the exploits of Elaine, uh, the, the perils of Pauline. They were fabulous serials we used to go and see on the Saturday. And then we'd act them out ourselves a bit. And whenever we did, I was always either Pauline or Elaine. <laughs> you see, I seemed to get cast. And I you liked that? Was I it your, didn't mind was it your own call? I loved being people. rescued by Eddie Polo, as it were. <laughs> well, this American experience, I think, was an important one insofar as if, up to that point, I had been what we now call closeted. I'd been very cautious. I was a professional museum man. Uh, that was the, my, my most important aspect. Uh, dressing rather conservatively, I was known as the man who wore suede shoes, really? uh, which was one of the, I suppose, the signs, but... Did you know that that was one of the signs? It was known to be one of... Well, it was all suspected mm. that if you wore suede shoes and a Liberty tie, lo lovely Liberty silk tie, you know... So if you were called that, you must have had a feeling that some people did know that you were... Oh, some people would know, yes, would, would assume. But there's no question of openly coming out mm -hmm. and, say, and having a group you belong to and saying, like, no, I am gay and I want you to know, or the Lord is my shepherd and he doesn't mind, you know, none of that sort mm -hmm. of thing. You kept it all rather very low profile. So the situation would be you'd, you'd have a few gay friends who would know that you were gay, and a, a large number of kind of casual heterosexual acquaintances who would certainly not know. I mean, no heterosexual would know that you were gay at that time. Mm. That right? I wouldn't say no. Uh, some might... I think the question was, is he or isn't he? Mm. They'd wonder, perhaps. And then they said... you wouldn't tell an anybody? I wouldn't tell anybody, no. Can we go on now, perhaps more quickly, through the sort of... Yes. Six, six yes, five, indeed. Five. What happened was, you see, that uh, I got caught in a loo in, late at night in Liverpool not doing anything, actually. Uh, I'd gone there hoping I might meet somebody, it is true. And I'd met somebody I knew and didn't like. <laughs> and we'd, we exchanged a few words and suddenly the door was flung open and these police officers came in waving a torch at us and said they got us. And we were charged. What with, were you charged with? With gross indecency, which I, there was a new term to me. I'd never heard of it. Mm. I didn't know what it meant. And they did things then that you wouldn't get away with now. They kept us in communicando for about three or four hours. I wanted to call the solicitor friend. They wouldn't let me. And to cut it quickly short, you know, you appear the next morning and then uh, pleading not guilty, but in due course deferred to the assizes. And I got a very bad judge who was a brute. And on a Friday, he kept going on about... Uh, little boys and monsters like me and protecting society from creatures like me and so on. He, he really harangued us, and I think it was his own guilt he was battering us. Mm. And the shock upset was that he said he couldn't make up his mind what to do, and he needed a weekend to think about it, and he was going to send us down for the weekend to have a taste of what it would be like. So we suddenly... I touched that guy for the first time, the other one, when we were handcuffed together by the police, which I think is ironic. And we were, we were sent to Leicester Jail for the weekend. Well, the governor was a friend of mine, and he was very nice about it, and, and uh, they made the conditions fairly reasonable. I had food sent in, uh, friends and a, a lawyer could come and visit. I wanted to resign immediately, but he said, no, 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 no. And then I actually feel this was one of the most traumatic weeks in your life. No, must, you that was the most extraordinary weekend. Uh, I terrified. I, I was hysterical a lot of the time, doped down with drugs and things. You know. And um, then did on you the feel that what you'd done was wrong? Or? No, I didn't. Therefore, I, I had a considerable resentment because I didn't. I was unaware of the law. I was unaware that it was a crime. I suppose I was aware that, in some vague way, that this was something some people did, but not everybody, you know. But did you even feel humiliated in front of the governor? I mean, since he was one of your friends, presumably he didn't know that you were gay at the time. He didn't know I was gay at the time. He knew once the, the thing had come into the light. A lot of people who didn't know suddenly... Was it in the papers, then? Oh, 
Or is it in the papers? And how? The local papers went to town. I had enemies. The town clerk was probably my chief enemy, uh, who had not liked the way I'd been treating the museum, see, making it all very lively. There were the old um, archaeological society people who thought that you shouldn't have disturbed anything. There were enemies, all mm. right. There were friends, too. The amazing thing was that suddenly friends came up well, some I knew, and they were marvellous, taking me into their home, because I, I wasn't fit to look after myself. I'd become so really n hysterical, breakdown virtually. And then on the Monday, uh, he, he, the judge sort of said, well, I've thought about it, and it's no good sending you to prison. You'll corrupt the others. Oh, that I should be so lucky. And, um, he said, I'm going to put you on probation for a year, provided you see the psychiatrist who has appeared for you every week for a year in order to be cured, and use the term. Mm -hmm. And I came out of the dock, rather shattered, and was confronted by the town clerk's representative with a, an envelope to say that my job had ceased, my salary had ceased, my pension rights were suspended. I found myself. I was 38, Psh. a career that was really going to town, you know, uh, completely collapsed on the ground, no money, no, no job, no... I had to sell up everything and go to London. And I was, again, I think very lucky that the Arts Council, uh, it wasn't then called the Arts Council, but the music people and the art people were very good to me and they gave me sort of something to keep me going. And it was then that I, you asked me earlier on about the relationship with a woman, I had known this girl uh, who was very attractive, very beautiful, much younger than I, and uh, she was keen on music and had come to talk to me and we'd met at House of Friends. But I said to her, look, I can't marry you. I'm a homosexual and it's no good. You'll find some man who will really be better for you. But now she turned up on the scene, and uh, seeing this psychiatrist, he brainwashed me. He was a Freudian, and he really sincerely believed that you could be cured, that you could be converted from being a, a homosexual to being a heterosexual. He told me so. And did you come to believe that? I came to believe it, because I didn't know he's the expert. Mm. He did also see this girl and talk to her, and the upshot was that we got married. And from the word go, it was a mistake. And I'm very clear about this. We remained married for, we remained legally married for a number of years, but actually, I would think, a very short time. Long enough to have two sons. Mm -hmm. I have two sons. Was that the first uh, heterosexual that relationship? That was the first time I'd ever had a, a sexual relationship with a woman. And the last time. Mm -hmm. The only time. Having been so secret before and, and absolutely shut in, uh, the newspapers, of course, got onto it. The Yorkshire Post, it was out, name published, where I came from, photograph of me kissing a boy. You know, it couldn't have been more. I thought, I'd I then go home. There'll be books through my windows. Quickly. My neighbors won't want to know. But uh, it didn't work out like that at all. It, it was. A, I summed it up that for years before I'd been having these various tranquilizers like Librium and what, and I said, three days in Sheffield did more for me than three years on Valium, and they're terribly true. Mm -hmm. And I, now, I then realized, if you like, I'd got a kind of mission in life, a renewed mission. Because people had said, you know, it's amazing meeting you, you've lived through it all, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. And here you are, out on the other side. Um.